Hey folks, welcome. It's the first Sunday, of course, in a new year. And we want to turn to a scripture that we're familiar with, no doubt. We're in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to turn to chapter 6 of that book. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're just simply going to read the first four verses. The reason we're just reading four verses, it's not the entire thing, but we're not going to cover the entire thing this morning. And God willing, we will be back in it in a couple of weeks' time. See, so God willing, we'll be here next Sunday morning, and then we'll get back into this the Sunday morning after that. I'm going to read the first four verses, Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Just those four verses, as I've said, it's not the entire uh, portion of Scripture that we want to read, but we will pick up on it again, God willing, in a fortnight's time. I've entitled this message this morning, Our Future in a Very Present Hand. Our future in a very present hand. Friends, we don't know what future days will hold for us. We think about this every year. We stand in the brink. We stand just into another new year. I said at the beginning, you know, calendars mark years. The days simply pass on. One day goes into the next. A new year doesn't really make much of a difference in the life of an individual. You just step into another day. And yet there's something about a new year that touches our minds and something about a new year that fills our hearts. As we think about what's behind, our sister prayed this morning, we're to forget about those things that are behind and, and quite rightly so, we leave them in the past. And yet it's good to recall and it's good to remember the blessings of the Lord, especially in times whenever we look into the future with an uncertainty. And we look into the future not really knowing what course things are going to take. See, friends, we're living at a time when practically anything can happen. Do you believe that today? Anything can happen. We live in a nation where there's complete political failure. And yet for years they have told us that politics is the answer for every nation in the world. Get the politics right the nation will do well. We live in a time of political failure. We are living in a time of social failure. People are so tied up with their own individual lives that as far as soci sociality, if you like, is concerned, no one really cares. We have come to the stage where it's you in your small corner and I in mine. And what odds what the person down the street is really feeling as long as my little world is progressing as it should do. We also live at a time when there's a breakdown of God-fearing society. And we know that. We know our laws have been changed. There's all sorts of stuff that is, that is flagrantly pushed into our faces from television and from the media. Whether we like it or whether we don't, things have changed and there's this decline in God-fearing society. We see a forsaking of the old paths. We see a forsaking of the old landmarks that have made our nation great, a world leader in its day. And yet many of those things have been cast aside as if they're meaningless, as if they are worthless, as if they had no significance, they had no part to play in the greatness of our nation. We are experiencing in these days change in things all over the world. Wouldn't you agree with that? What about Australia? Huh? What about those bushfires that they just have been unable to contain? They've been unable to keep them under control. And people have lost everything. People have lost their lives. 
and the hardship and the difficulty that that brings upon a nation. You know, we live here, we probably have no idea. No, I certainly haven't. I have no idea what that could be like. We're living at a time when there's earthquakes, fires, as I've said, storms. I saw a thing on, 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 on YouTube the other night. Listen, hailstones, that size, and that's not exaggerating. Cars, bonnets dinged with the hailstones. We're just living at a time in the world when there's this tremendous, tremendous, tremendous turmoil. And then what about the flooding? Why would you like to be living in some parts of England, you know, where your living room has been maybe that depth under foul flood water? The hardships, the difficulties, the things that are happening all around us. And in fact, in the midst of all of that which is happening, many people, people are, are, are they're in hopelessness. They're in complete despair. And yet today, praise God, we have a hope, haven't we? Glory to his holy name. Because we have a hope because we have him. We have a great God and a great Savior. We have an omniscient, we have an omnipotent, we have an omnipresent God. A God who knows all. A God who has the power to do all things. And a God where there is nowhere that he is not. That's the one whom we have. And the one whom we worship. You know, this morning I want to, to focus our hearts upon a new vision. A new vision. You know, friends, I believe that that's what our nation needs in these days of time. Our nation needs to get a, a new glimpse of God. I believe that's what the church needs in these days of time. We need to get a new glimpse, a new vision of who God really is. And listen, I'm not talking about what you read. Thank God for his word. Thank God for how the Holy Spirit quickens that to our hearts and lives. I'm not talking about what you believe because the word says it. I'm not talking about how you view God because of your belief pattern in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about just catching a new vision of God. Something that's real. Something that we can see. Something that we can feel. Something that we can sense. Not just something that's in the book that lies open before us, but something that's real in our very experience in these days of time. Is that what we need today? A fresh vision of God. You know, there's a story told about a man that went to the doctor. And he says to him, doctor, he says, I don't know what's wrong with me. He says, whenever I touch my head, I'm sore. He says, whenever I touch my shoulder, I'm sore. He says, whenever I touch my chest, he says, I'm sore. Whenever I touch my stomach, I'm sore. Whenever I touch my leg, he says, I'm just so sore. He says, even if I touch my foot, I'm just so sore. He said, doctor, what could be wrong with me? And the doctor, he gave him an examination. And he says to him, friend, he says, I'll tell you exactly what's wrong with you. He says, you've got a broken finger. A broken finger. Friends, there are many painful situations in the Christian life that can be traced to one single problem. One problem. It is our view of God and it is our attitude about God. That's the problem. A.W. Tozer wrote a book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And in the preface of that book, he writes this, the low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. The decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way towards curing them. That's just in the preface of his book. In chapter 1 of the book, he writes, What comes into our minds whenever we think about God is the most important thing about us. What a statement that is. What comes into your mind 
whenever you think about God. Because Tozer says that's the most important thing about us. He goes on and he says, History will show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and no religion has ever been greater than the ideal view that they hold of God. What we believe and how we think about God will greatly affect our lives. A low view of God tends to produce a low form of living. A lofty view of God tends to produce a higher form of living. Maybe we just need a new vision. Maybe we just need a a real glimpse of who God really is. In this vision that we have lying before us in chapter 6, Isaiah, he got a proper view of the holy God of heaven that would forever change his view of God and would change the course of his life. You know, friends, if the course of our lives and if the course of our nation is to be changed, then we need to see God, perhaps, as Isaiah saw him. Would that not be right? Because the reason people continue to live on godly lifestyles is because they have no real revelation of who God is. The God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of them that believe not. They can't see with their eyes. They can't see the greatness. They can't see the glory of the God whom we own as our very own. Their eyes are closed. They walk blindly, so to speak, in the dark because of that. And our nation today is in the condition that it is in because people have abandoned the faith of our forefathers. Church is largely to blame for that. I'm the church. You're the church. I'm to blame for that. You can determine whether you can add yourself into that or not. But that's who's to blame. And people have closed their eyes to the God of glory because there's no significant reality of him being present. What our nation and the church needs is a new vision of God. I'll tell you another story. A young lad was sitting in class. He was in, in, in art class in his school and they were drawing pictures. And he was sitting at his desk, drawn away, and the teacher, as teachers do, was walking around amongst the children in the class and so on. And she comes to this young lad, and he's, he's sitting there, drawn away, and she looks at the page, and she says to him, what are you drawing? And he says to her, miss, he says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she says, wait a minute, but she says, sure, no one really knows what God looks like. Well, said the lad, they will whenever I'm finished. What a reply that was. They will whenever I'm finished. You see, that should be our mission statement, folks. That should be the church's mission statement. What is God like? People will see what God is like by the time we're finished. Whenever we are doing what we're supposed to do, people will see the reality of God. I was listening to someone preach yesterday evening. And he says, whenever you're successful in anything, he says, you never have to advertise a thing. And yet we're living in days in church life when we can't get people through the door. Do you know why? The church is not successful in portraying what God is really like in the world that God has placed us. The world around us, your street, your family, we've touched on all of this stuff before. They are going to know what God looks like because of you and because of me. Because some of them never opened that book at all. We put out a thousand magazines around this village before Christmas. Alistair did the most of the footwork in that. But we put out a thousand magazines. I got a letter posted to me before Christmas. person didn't sign the letter. They never do. And it came from someone in another denomination in this village. 
and I'm not going to tell you what denomination that was. And it was just signed a concerned and in the name of the denomination. And in that letter, that person said that we were encouraging people to watch television and to watch a film on television called Cats whenever we should be encouraging people to read their Bible. And yet that person failed to realize that in the magazine it tells you what the film Cats is all about. And it's a story of redemption that was written by a Christian, T.S. Eliot. And how in this story a cat, it's acted out as a musical, but in this story a particular cat comes to the place where that cat is just sorry. There's a song in it where the cat sings a song called Memories. And the cat has all of these memories of the things it has done in the past. And it's so sorry and repentant because of that that the cat becomes born again into what's called the heavenly lair. L-A-I-R. And it's a story of redemption. It's a story of repentance. And yet that individual, I don't know whether it was a man or woman, wrote a letter to complain that we were encouraging people to watch television. I would rather them watch a story like that about redemption, you know, because they're not reading their Bible. And is it not better than watching something like that on television than listening and watching something that's full of cursing and swearing and violence and sex and all of the other stuff that's there? In that little magazine, there was also a competition. I think first prize was maybe 100 pounds, and the second prize was 50 pounds. And there was a number of prizes that were maybe 10 pounds. I think there was maybe a couple or three that were 25 pounds. There was an amount of money being given away. And you could get that money or get vouchers to, to, to use that way. And this individual said, you are encouraging people to gamble. Now, no money has passed hands whatsoever. But the whole idea of the competition was the, the five or six questions that were asked in the competition were all answerable if you had read your way through the magazine. And that was all the competition was there for. It was so that people would search the magazine to find the answers. We weren't encouraging gambling. It was just a simple competition. Folks, how we need to get a vision of God. Huh? We tear one another down. We pull to pieces what others are trying to do. And that letter came to me just before Christmas. And I don't mind telling you, there was a day or two that played very largely in my mind. And sometimes we can fail to see the greatness of God, and sometimes we fail to, to break through into the presence of God because of stuff that's touching our lives. Stuff that's there. Stuff that hinders. Stuff that keeps us out of the presence of God. We'll look at that in a fortnight's time. That's not really what we're looking at this morning. But here we find a man, and something has happened in his life. Something has happened. I saw also the Lord high, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Listen, this is a man of God. This is the voice of God to the nation. This is a man who in the opening chapters has pronounced the, the judgment of God upon the people and he has continually said, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. He takes all the different peoples that he's speaking to and the word of God to them in the day in which he lived was, woe unto you. And all of a sudden this man of God catches a flesh glimpse of God. And again, we're not touched on this this morning, but his next cry is, Woe is me! Woe is me! For I am undone. And maybe as a church, we need a fresh touch from God, a fresh vision of God in that way. If you work your way through the book of Isaiah, you will find many wonderful uh, descriptions and great declarations and definitions about God. In this chapter, we see this wonderful vision that Isaiah has here. And he saw that God was an awesome God. I hate that word awesome. Because we have bantered that word awesome about so much. Everything's awesome. 
Sometimes everything's not awesome, but we do have an awesome God. Remember the chorus years ago? Our God is an awesome God. He reigns in heaven above. In wisdom, righteousness, and love, our God is an awesome God. And dear loved, beloved, so he is. He is an awesome God. And here, I want just to linger today mainly upon the greatness of a reigning God. He reigns. The greatness of a reigning God. Because one of the first things that Isaiah expresses here, the first things that caught Isaiah's attention was that God was ruling and reigning in all of his glory and in all of his greatness. Isaiah sees a throne. A throne. If you research that thought through Isaiah, you will find that he mentions a throne seven times throughout these chapters. And in chapter 66 and verse 1, God himself gives a description of that throne. Isaiah 66 and 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Think of the height of that throne. Think of the greatness. And that's how God describes it. And Isaiah says here, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. High and lifted up. This throne was raised to a lofty position so as to distinguish it as a place of honor, to distinguish it as a place of prestige. Isaiah saw that this throne was occupied. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. In other words, God was ruling and God was reigning. And Isaiah saw that his train filled the temple. Did you ever watch the queen? Whenever she goes in to make her speech in the Houses of Parliament, she didn't do it this last time, but the previous time, in all of her robes. And she sits down upon her throne And the train of her robe goes right out. Have you ever seen that? Friends, if that's the pomp, and if that's the majesty, and if that's the prestige of an earthly monarch, what must the majesty and the prestige of an eternal monarch not be like? His train, he says, it filled the temple. The word train, speaking of the age of a garment. In other words, God is sitting and God is reigning in all of his greatness. In Psalm 103, 19, it says, The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom reigns and rules over all. Isaiah saw him as Lord. Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. Every name for God in the Old Testament has a significance. Every name and its location in the Old Testament has a specific significance as to what is being spoken of. And the title Lord here speaks of a sovereign master, a sovereign monarch, one who's reigning supreme. Isaiah saw the one who is in charge. Praise God, he saw the one who is in absolute control of all of the affairs and the events of this world. Amen. Amen. And friends, you see, we believe that because of our faith. We believe that because we read it in the Word. But let me ask you, when did you last experience that in your own situation? That He reigns supreme. That you're not depending on somebody else to do something. You're not depending on some organization to come through for you. Listen, we depend so much upon our National Health Service and praise God for it all. But friends, we have a God who's beyond all of that. Hallelujah. He's the God of miracles. He's the God who opened the eyes of the blind. He's the God who gave, gave, I was going to say eyesight to ears. He He gave hearing to ears. He gave strength to cripples. That's the God that we need to see. That's the God that we need in these days of time. Because that's the God whom we worship. Amen. And listen, if he's anything less than that, Don't come back here because it's pointless. And I'm not just saying that about this church. Why would anyone want to worship a God who isn't a God of all power? A God who can do all kinds of miracles. 
A God who can meet every single need. Hallelujah. And a God who needs no one to help him to do that. The problem with us in the church in these days of time is we don't prove God in that way. Because we have so many other things touching our lives that we're kept out of that deeper presence and that deeper experience of who he is and what he really looks like and what he can do. One of our previous churches, we had a lady who came to that church, I've told you this before, and she worked in the local doctor's surgery. And many of the time in that church there were people who came out to the front and got prayed for. And whenever they were going back to sit in their seat, they said to her, I'll give you a ring to get an appointment in the morning. Now, folks, that's truth. And to understand, I, I'm not getting out the health service. I'm just not. George is sitting there. A miracle. Isn't that right? Thank God for the health service. But where is the reality of this great God who sits upon the circle of the heavens, whose tree and fills the temple, whose glory is beyond every other, whose position is far above everything else, who keeps all things together by the word of his power. Where's this God at? He is an absolute master, in absolute power, and he rules over all. And friends, that's one truth that you can be certain of. Would you be prepared to stake your life on that? I wonder would I. Remember the Hebrew children? Remember them? Hey, taken from their homeland, taken to Babylon, taken into idolatry. And there they are. Listen, just young teenagers. Let, let's, let's be realistic about this. Just young, boy, we despise young people. Why do we do that? Why do we not allow young people the room to be what young people need to be? Why do we not encourage young people to develop into everything that God wants them to be? Instead of that, push them to the side. Don't do what they want you to do. Let's continue to do it the way we've always done it. Why are we like that? Because you see, there were loads of people who were taken captive to Babylon. But it was three young people that refused to bow the knee. Isn't that right? Ah, if you don't bow the knee, we'll throw you into the fiery furnace. What a stand they took. Boy, they could teach us a lesson. You know, listen, even you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God can deliver us. And listen, even if he doesn't, we'll still not bow the knee to you anyway. I wonder would we be prepared to stake our lives in something like that? Because folks, listen to me, please. The day's coming in this nation whenever you're going to have to. Make you no mistake about that. Things have changed. Things have gone. We're living in a new day. We're living with a new view. We're living with a new mindset in the nation. And before you and I are finished, you're going to be called upon to stand up for your faith or else renounce it. Make no mistake about that. That's the days that we're living in. But do we really believe that he's God and he's master, ruler over all? Are we really certain about that? God is on the throne. Someone has said his hand is on the throttle. Praise God. He's in charge. He's ruler. He's in absolute control. You know, I've told you before, whenever the Russian cosmonauts first went up into space, you know, they gloated at that time. They came back down and they gloated and they said, you know, we have been up out of the earth's atmosphere. We have been up in the sky. We have circled the earth. We have gone round it a few times and we've never seen God. We've never seen God. And I love the, res the response that W.A. Chiswell gave to them. Uh, he says, if those cosmonauts had a step out of their, out of their space suits, they'd have seen God all right. See, we think because we don't see him, he's not there. Friends, he is there. Glory to his holy name. Psalm 97 verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. Listen to this. Let the earth rejoice. 
Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. In Revelation 19 and 6, we hear those, those surrounding the throne of God saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He's the God of all power. When we look at this world of ours in which we find ourselves today, a world where truth is laughed at, a world where evil, evil is applauded, a world in which so many bad things happen, a world in which so many wrong things exist, it's tempting to wonder if God is really on the throne. But thank God today he is. Can you say an amen to that? Amen. Say it like you mean it. Amen. Let's confess what he is. Let's not be afraid to exalt the name of the Lord our God. You know, John in his gospel in chapter 12, John made an interesting statement here about this vision of Isaiah. John chapter 12, verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw the glory and spoke of him. And John was saying that what Isaiah saw, whenever he saw him sitting upon the throne, the one that Isaiah saw in all of his greatness as a monarch, as a reigning God, was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was crucified. Praise God, on the third day he rose from the dead. Bless his wonderful and holy name. He rose, and now he is seated upon the throne. And the throne is not some earthly church, or some earthly cathedral, or some earthly place where there's a headquarters, so to speak, of some particular denomination. But his throne is high, and praise God, it is lifted up far above every other. His kingdom shall never come to an end, and he will always be on the throne, ruling and reigning. And that's the throne of Isaiah's vision. Hallelujah. Unshakable, unmovable, and praise God, eternal in the heavens. And so we see the glory of the reigning monarch. Let me mention the time of Isaiah's vision just before I close, because it's significant. It says in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died. The death of Uzziah was a, a shattering blow to Judah and to the prophet Isaiah as well. Uzziah had reigned over the nation, although he had disobeyed God, and he died as a leper. But during his lifetime, during his reign, Judah had, had prospered during his reign. He had led them... Politically, he had also led them materially, and he had led them militarily to great levels. And he, they had been strong. He left them in that position. He was a, a strong supporter of the prophet Isaiah and his ministry. But now, Uzziah's dead. Now that prop has been taken away. Now that person that everyone was depending upon is gone. And yet in such an hour when people on earth were lamenting and weeping over the fact that there was an empty throne on earth, Isaiah catches this great vision of a throne that's occupied eternal in the heavens. Folks, what does that say to us? It says, lift up your eyes. In the New Testament, it says, lift up the hands that hang down. It says, strengthen the feeble knees. The Bible tells us that we're to fix our eyes upon things above, not on things on the earth. The Bible tells us that we're to lift ourselves. We're to look unto the Lord God Almighty, because He is the ever-living God. And look, there may be stuff going on in your life. There may be stuff going on in the country all around us. But the word is simply this. Keep your eyes upon Jesus, because He is reigning. And praise God, He will reign forever. And He's a very, very present hand in your life and mine, as we acknowledge Him and as we look to Him. Isaiah sees this great vision. Look, the world, your world, may seem to be falling apart. But folks, remember God. God is on the throne. 
And he's dressed in honor. And he's dressed in glory. And he's in control. Hallelujah. Let me read you Psalm 146. Go to read the whole Psalm. And then we're finished. It simply says this. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. O oh, happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed. Let me say something to you. If someone has wronged you, they'll pay for it. You leave that to God. You leave that to God. Get it behind you. Leave it with him. He executes judgment for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord looses the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Are you righteous today? Aren't you saved by the grace of God? Are you? Are you washed in the blood of Jesus? Are you? Do you wear the righteousness of Jesus? Do you? Well, then the Bible says you are loved today. Hallelujah. Amen. Never wonder it says, let the earth rejoice. The Lord, verse 9, preserveth, <laughs> preserveth the stranger. He relieves the fatherless, the widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Friends, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Glory to his lovely name. The day the outlook may be bleak, but praise God the uplook is what? Glorious. Amen. Absolutely glorious. Because he knows where you are. And he knows what you are facing. And listen to me. He knows exactly how you feel. Exactly how you feel. And he's saying, look up. He's saying, lift up. He's saying, don't give up. Don't give up. But feast your eyes upon the greatness and the glory of the Lord. For he's reigning in complete power, in complete sovereignty. And he wants you to focus on the greatness of the reigning king. We've already quoted Psalm 97, verse 1. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let's just bow in prayer for a moment. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Are you downcast today? Could that be your situation? Well, friends, there's so many things in life that would pull us down. I want you just where you're sitting right now, just to lift your heart, lift your mind, lift your eyes heavenward. Because today, praise God, there's a man in the glory. And he bears marks for you. And your citizenship is not in this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. Lord, the psalmist could say, I will lift up my eyes onto the hills. From whence comes my help? My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Lord, just let your presence, let your, your power just touch people, even in this congregation right now. And Lord, this word 
take away anything that's of self or flesh. And Holy Spirit, that which was spoken by you, will you write it upon hearts to bring encouragement, to bring blessing, to bring strength, Lord, to bring ability. Lord, we're a needy people. We live in a needy time. But we thank you we have an all-sufficient God. And we come to you right now and we ask your blessing upon every single life that's bowed before you. We each one challenged, yes, but we each one be encouraged today, Lord, because you are God and you hold us in the very hollow of your great hand. Thank you for that. Just bless every life we pray, committing it now to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God.